Hey everyone, it's Nathan with Crowning Calor. And if you wonder why I'm dressed like RoboCop's sporty cousin, that's because today we're gonna to be talking about cycling. Now there are a few reasons that we're gonna talk about cycling. First and foremost, I love cycling. I mean, I'm wearing a freaking Crown and Caliber jersey of all things, so let's get that out of the way. And secondarily, and most importantly, we have the pleasure of chatting with Phil Guyman. Now, Phil Guyman is a retired professional cyclist, and he and I actually connected over watches. So we're gonna get to hear some of his stories as a professional cyclist. We're gonna get to hear what he's doing now in cycling. And we're also gonna get to hear a little bit about why he likes watches and his personal collection. So let's go ahead and give Phil Guyman a call. And actually first, I'm gonna take this off. I don't need to wear sunglasses indoors. Could probably keep the helmet on, but I'll take it off. And for the viewers that are watching, I'll keep the jersey on. So let's give Phil a call. Hey Phil, man, how are you? Great. So for everyone that's watching, can you just kind of give a little bit of a, a brief history of um, your career in cycling and kind of what you're doing now? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I raced professionally for 10 years, um, retired. At, I was, I was a kind of always good at, at social media and storytelling. I wrote a couple books sort of while I was racing. Um, and now I, I stopped at 30. I stopped racing and sort of pivoted to a uh, YouTube show, kind of just took the sponsors that I had relationships with from, from racing and brought it into doing fun stuff that's not exactly competitive, but uh, adventures on the internet. And uh, that's that's how I make a living now. That's awesome. Um, well, you may not brag on it, but I will. You've got to talk about the worst retirement ever. Can you just expound on that idea? It's, I, I absolutely love it. Just just give us a little yeah. bit about that. So the idea of worst retirement ever is there's, there's a social media app called Strava um, that, that pros don't really mess around with but but I, maybe now they have but in the past we we certainly didn't um but it's a place you can sort of upload your runs workouts whatever um and you can upload your rides and it's kind of just you know it's it's think of it as instagram for a workout it's just here's what i did for my ride here's a couple pictures i took um but there's also an element of there's you can define a certain segment and they keep track of different times up uh like whatever every mountain in the world has a strava segment now um, and you can compare your times with your friends and pros and whatever. Um, so I kind of stopped racing and set out to win Strava with uh, just going for all the hill climb records that I can. So the idea of worst retirement ever is I'm retired from racing, but I'm still suffering and flogging myself up mountains 24-7. Um, so that's that's it's been a lot of fun. It is. And I got to say, as a viewer, it is pure enjoyment, man. I'm um, watching you slog up these mountains. Your commentary is so good. Um, you, I got to say, you've got to be one of the only cyclists that makes climbing mountains seem fun. <laughs> like, it's, that's, 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 a, that's a compliment. Yeah. If I can make it, if I can make climbing mountains watchable, that's something that, that the Tour de France has been 50-50 on over the years. Exactly. Um, so if I could do that, it's good talking about other things that you've done that is crazy and I know this is probably the, the only thing you don't want to talk about can you just share with us your experience on the Everstein record kind of explain what it is oh, yeah. um, I mean it's fascinating for people that don't know so I think it's definitely worth explaining sure so the Everesting was the, the idea I think it was kind of invented for people who wanted to to do something crazy and some cycling challenge but don't want to like be in a pack of people bumping elbows at 40 miles an hour which which is exactly where I'm at in life now. <laughs> um, so really no, no pros had really tried it um, up until this year. And I was sort of the first to be like, I'm going to go for the Everesting record. It wasn't really a record thing like they had, they keep track of it, but people weren't really competing for the record. They were just doing it for completion um, and, and a weird kind of fun. So the idea is it's the equivalent of Mount Everest um, on, on one road up and down over and over. So you can't do, you can't do a loop. You can't do, uh, you know, you can't use your momentum for a different hill. Um, and it's 29,029 feet is the exact Mount Everest height. So you're just going up and down that for some, you know, up to 25 hours for whatever, however long people are doing it for. Um, the record was eight and a half hours. Um, I, I went for it once and did 750. Um, and then since then, a ton of pros have gone for it. Alberto Contador went for it, and the record is now like close. It's almost it's a it's an Irish guy named Ronan McLaughlin, uh, and it's close to seven hours even. Uh, so I've been kind of plotting my whole year to to try and take it back, 
Um, and which basically just boils down to I needed to not be 100 degrees out and I live in Los Angeles. So I'm like finding the right hill is critical and then uh, and then just doing so that that's my next chapter on YouTube is it's starting to be fall here. It's it's pushing October. So it's still 95 degrees. But uh, at some point we'll get down there and, and I'm, I'm still I, I think I'm narrowing down the hill that I'm going to attempt it on. So we're uh, we're working on it. And you found a hill in L.A. Um, I, I can't confirm or disconfirm my my hill at this point. Okay, based on one of your recent videos, it could be close. Um, awesome. And and I, you also recently had a video where you interviewed McLaughlin, or however you yeah. say his last name. And I, I think yeah, that yeah. is, if anyone watching this is interested, definitely go check out that video, because it is super cool to see um, what goes into an Everstein record and how it's, right. it definitely takes somewhat of a team when you're cheating for so this. It's a super dorky sport, and I think Everesting is, is way up there on the dorky side of the spectrum. Yeah, it's it's exciting to watch this. I kind of like fast forwarding over the past six months or even year and how like you kind of kick something off and there was something weird about, it was cool to watch Lachlan do it and then seeing Contador go and do it, which kind of felt like a marketing thing. I think it made it all the better that McLaughlin, this guy comes out of nowhere yeah. and is like, yeah, I can do it. So I think it, it it kind of brings it back. Minutes on through it too. That was that was what was really fun. Is is you realize like okay the the, the cocky old pro who you know you win a few tours to France you think you know what you're doing, and then kind of a, a smart Irish guy who was you know a high level racer but but not Contador esque um, just out nerded him and and uh, and did his own thing. So I'm I'm hoping to to follow in Ronan's footsteps. That's awesome. So yeah, yeah. you mentioned you're in LA and I got the idea for. Um, chatting with you, um, watching the tour, and seeing Julian Alaphilippe wearing a Richard Meal, which is an absurdly expensive watch. Yeah, I have three of those. Yeah, you know, they're just sitting around. Um, I live in a shack and I have watches that cost more than homes, um, which is rare to see a cyclist in that level kind of wearing a watch, which was interesting because in the last stage yesterday, Pogaccio was wearing a watch and I couldn't see what it was, but I'm sure it had something to do with a sponsor sponsorship or something. Yeah. So, seeing that and then recent in recent months watching one of your videos and noticing that you wear a watch and why don't you tell us a little bit about the watch that you wear because i think it's pretty cool that you're in la and the watch you're wearing is a weiss watch yeah so um so yeah this is a uh, weiss the just the standard field watch i think um the what's it the the time is wrong now because it's automatic and i i haven't been wearing it enough uh, I got to get one of those winders, but yeah. part of me, I'm, I'm bothered by the idea of a winder because what's cool about an automatic is that it runs on perpetual whatever. Yeah. And now you got to plug it in <laughs> and now you're back on the grid. You know what I mean? I want my yeah. watch to be off the grid. So I'll, I'll just wear it for a little bit and then, and then reset the time. That's how I operate. But um, yeah, so a couple of years ago, I, I had a, I had a funny, this is another long YouTube saga. This year was Everesting on my YouTube. A couple of years ago, I had a, I had a war with Fabian Cancellara who's a two-time Olympic gold medalist. Um, and and part of the thing there was we, we ended up going to, I, I went to Switzerland and like raced him up this climb. Uh, we did a race to be fair, it's just he wasn't really training for it. Um, but the uh, but we, we did that and, and I wanted to really, really double down on making fun of Switzerland. Um, so I, I kind of tracked down the the Weiss folks and, and asked for, I want an LA watch, you know, I don't want, yeah. And obviously all the all the parts are Swiss, so whatever. But the uh, but so Cancellara, I forget who his watch sponsor was. A lot of the the top pro cyclists, you know, it's a very like it's a wealthy sport. Yeah, and a lot of those guys just end up getting you know deals with Rolex or Breitling or, or whatever else. Um, so Cancellara had one, um, and and I was like, all right, I'm gonna come back at that with this LA field watch, um, and I'm gonna have American cheese instead of Swiss cheese on my sandwich. And, and I, yeah, I just pushed that the whole year. So, so these folks uh, gave me a nice watch and it's still, it's still ticking and it's, it's perfect for me too. I'm, I don't, I'm not like a fancy watch person, but I, I think it's, it's, it's understated. It's kind of classy um, and it does all the things. So I don't wear it riding. It's still like kind of a special occasion thing. Yeah. I, I can't imagine wearing a luxury watch riding that just, that, that boats for falling off the bike and doing, you know, irreparable yeah, damage. Mean, those don't fall off as much as, as, as you might think. Um, the thing in the tour, I wonder what the average, I feel like in the tour, you're, you're likely to crash one time. If you do the tour de France, it's, you know, it's three weeks and there's a lot of, like, I think everybody probably averages one crash. 
Um, you know, and that doesn't mean you're all torn up. It just means your your knee hit the pavement once. But yeah. I think it's pretty safe under those conditions to to wear to wear something. It's <laughs> it's also you know that's that's when you're on TV. So if you have a sponsor, they're not interested in you wearing it to the bar later. That, that doesn't make it on Instagram. Yeah. You know? yeah, they want you to get in a breakaway and make sure you've got yeah. your wrist just smack up there on top. Um, I wonder if they sold any watches from from what's his name wearing it in the stage. I wonder if if people were like, oh, that's you know, if there's a return on that. Let me go, let me go and see what, uh, what he's wearing. You find out it costs hundred thousand yeah. plus dollars. And you're yeah, like, yeah, Instagram maybe not. swipe up and they sell 50 of them. Yeah, exactly. Something that is cool with Weiss is, I mean, now they actually, Cameron's making like actual movements in yeah. LA, which is truly fascinating. Yeah, um, yeah, it's in like uh, one of the, it's a different model, bigger watch, but that's like pretty unprecedented, like watch, movements in america which i think is pretty cool but i think what is also cool is their watches are in the grand scheme of things more affordable and i think like you don't have to be a watch nerd to appreciate watches um yeah. and i think that's i wouldn't call you necessarily a watch nerd but the fact that you are you you've done the research you found weiss watch like i think that's pretty cool um is there like I know you're a pretty practical guy. Is there another watch you're like, ah, oh, one day I could see myself owning that? Or are you pretty content with Weiss? Or is there, you're like, I would kill for a time I like I like this one a lot. I think, um, I don't know, I'm not a person who who like wears a suit or wears expensive anything. Like I, I like, I guess I like things that work well and yeah. that last a long time. So just in general, like this this is cool. When um, there's, there's not, I don't know, I, I, I can certainly like look at a $200,000 watch and appreciate it, but I also, would would hate myself wearing it or having it like that's just not that's not for me um you know i i drive a hybrid <laughs> but the uh I, I have i have one other watch which is when 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 my dad passed a few years ago my my dad that's that's where i get not liking things from mm -hmm. um my dad wore he was a professor at Georgia tech he wore jeans and and a t-shirt to class every day um and and when he died my mom was like yeah, we're going through his stuff and she's like do you want his do you want his watch and i'm like mom that's a casio <laughs> it's like this plastic <laughs> i'm like i pre like no i nobody wants that that's the, he didn't even want that it was in a drawer somewhere uh so kind of in but in that in that realm i bought i bought a rolex um that's it's a wind up 1986 which is my birth year um i think nice. it was like 1800 i got it at a, at a um you know certified whatever used uh store on santa monica boulevard um so yeah, it's my birth year, so I kind of got this to remember my dad, mm -hmm. and uh, and this is sort of the correct amount of watch for me if I want to be if I want to be fancy and and, and go out. Um, this is just like an old Air King. That's sort of all I know. Yeah, um, but I yeah. do I do like having it. I don't I don't wear it often. That is a uh, I love those watches. And mine, the one I wear, and I work for a watch company, so oh yeah, is the date version of pretty much what you have. Like very simple, very clean, like. I think there's something about, again, I work for a watch company, so they take it with a grain of salt, but I want as practical of a luxury item as I can get. And so I love those Air Kings, man. Those are awesome. Anything uh, that I have, like this is the car, bike, whatever, and I have, I have real fancy bikes. If <laughs> I, if I'm, if I'm scared to scratch it, if I'm scared to use it what it's, for what it's for, I shouldn't have it. You know, like as soon as I've, I've, I got my car cleaned a few weeks ago and, and as soon as there's like, I didn't want the dog to get in there. And then it's like, no, that's what it's for. Put the dog in there. If I if, if I care about the dog here, I shouldn't have the car. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's almost like you want signs of life, like signs of it being lived in, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think that that's a good point to the practicality of watches where it's, you can purchase them for whatever reason, whether it's an achievement or remembering your dad. And it kind of has that place. But if it, it sits in a box, 365 days a year, then it really doesn't have a place. You know, if it's something where it's for special occasions, like that's awesome. If it's for the memory, that's awesome. But yeah, like if you're buying cars or homes or watches and it's not being used, that kind of defeats the purpose almost. You know, it's, I think it's it, it's probably a lot like cycling in in ways. There's there's a lot of people who like who like I, I like riding bikes. Yeah. Um, like having I like having all the nice stuff. And the you know you can get you, my my bike is eleven thousand um, dollars, and that's just one of them. And so like you can you can do that. And I think a lot of people 
are into bikes just as much for being able to dork out on them and have a clean, beautiful bike that just kind of hangs there that they don't ride. Um, and, and that's just a different, it's a different category, the exact same sport. And we like the same thing for very different reasons. But a lot of cyclists, I think, are in that category. It's like, I just want this fine, you know, Italian thing hanging on the wall and I don't care if I ever pedal it. And like, I'm down with that too. That's just not, that's just not what I'm into. Yeah, I, I think there's a is, a, is a good balance where I'm probably somewhere in between there. Mine doesn't hang on a wall, um, but I definitely appreciate nice bikes, but also don't ride nearly as much as you do. <laughs> <laughs> my, my body may fall apart if I did that. Yeah, that's uh, fair. So I have to ask, what is one of the craziest stories back from you being a professional cyclist? Doesn't have to be watch related, of course, but just kind of a glimpse into an industry that people probably aren't super familiar with. Um, do you have any crazy stories? I mean, there's so many, it's hard to narrow it down. I wrote two books. The, um, I, I guess the, what, what, I, what I think is interesting about cycling is it's, it's very much like a working man sport. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the top couple guys are getting watches like that. Um, but, but in the Tour de France, there's a lot of dudes making $45,000 a year and competing at the highest level. That's, I, I'm, I would guess that's like a third of the pack is, so is that. And then you're talking about, you know, 10, 20 guys that are in seven figures. Um, and then there's just a whole a ton in between. But that's what's kind of fun about cycling is you're kind of like, those those are still your peers and you're still on the bus and, and you're sharing, everyone's in a shitty hotel room. It's it's like a very, it's a very amateur sport in a lot of ways. Like, yeah. you know, it's not the NBA, it's not glamorous. And that's kind of what makes it cool. Um, and what, what I enjoyed when I was there is just like, even if you're getting 5 million a year, you've got to enjoy this to put up with it. <laughs> just to, to be in a pack in, you know, racing, just going down a mountain at 50 miles an hour in the rain um, and potentially on your ass some of that. So that's, that's that, I guess that's kind of what's, what's wild and, and cool about it. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And that's a, that's a really cool perspective where it is kind of just like, even at the highest level, it kind of feels like the amateur sport. I've never thought about it like that because I'm not a professional cyclist, but that's yeah. a cool perspective to think about these guys, like you are doing it because you love it. And that's what you really hope, you know, like, I mean, that's why you're still punishing yourself yeah. up mountains. Exactly, you can't you can't be in that world and, and not somehow be into it. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah. Well, hey, Phil, man, thank you so much for taking some time and chatting no with us. It's awesome to, especially in these kind of scenarios, connect with um, fellow cyclists and fellow watch lovers at any level. So I appreciate the time, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Good to be here. All right, guys, well, there you have it. I hope you had as much fun as I did talking with Phil Guyman, and you should definitely go check out his channel. The Worst Retirement Ever is truly enjoyable. You get to watch an athlete doing what he does best, and like I said, the commentary is great. So I'll make sure to leave a link in the description below. And like I said, go check out The Worst Retirement Ever. It is awesome. And as always, guys, thanks for watching.